All right, so yesterday we just ended uh, at 5 o'clock, but I want to do one more example of uh, our, our perturbed Kepler problem. And this is the problem where you have a test body or point mass orbiting a body that has a quadrupole moment. So our equation of motion then, the relative equation between the two bodies is our Newtonian acceleration. And then there's a term that is proportional to the J2, the quadrupole moment, of one of the bodies. So this could be a satellite orbiting the Earth, a small black hole orbiting a supermassive black hole with a quadrupole moment because it's a rotating black hole, and so on. Of course, in the black hole case, there are these additional relativistic terms, but let's just focus on the uh, Newtonian quadrupole term. So it's proportional to r squared, the, the radius of the of this body that has a quadrupole moment, and it falls off as one over r to the fourth compared to the one over r squared of the Newtonian term. And it also depends on direction. E is the symmetry axis of our of our body with the quadrupole moment, and n is the radial unit vector. So you see there's angular dependence in this perturbation. So it both breaks the one over r squared law and breaks spherical symmetry. So, plug this into our uh, Lagrange planetary equations for, for, for perturbed orbits. Take the radial component, the component uh, tangential component out of the plane, and average over one orbit of our binary system to get any secular effects. There'll be lots of periodic oscillations of all the orbit elements, but we really just care about secular changes, changes that grow time after time and just get bigger and bigger. When you do that, you discover in this case that A, E, and I are all constants. So these uh, variables do not change. The energy is constant. This is a conservative equation, so we know energy is conserved. And so A, a uh, is a constant, um, and so on. So you get no changes in any of these, but you do get an advance of the perihelion. No big surprise because we have changed from the pure inverse square law, and we know that's essentially the only place, only example where you get this constancy of the uh, pericenter. So the pericenter advances and the angle line of nodes also advances. Okay. So this has interesting applications and of course uh, one that we'll return to uh, a little later once we do general relativity is in Mercury's orbit. The Sun has a quadrupole moment and that will contribute an additional amount to the advance of the perihelion of Mercury. For a quadrupole moment of about 2.2 times 10 to the minus 7, that gives about 0.03 arc seconds per century compared to the GR prediction of 40, 43 arc seconds per century. But this is, if you remember the accuracy, we were talking about 0 0.001 arc seconds per century is the current you know, uncertainty in the, in the measurements. So this is something that is actually measurable in tracking Mercury's orbit. And in fact, for many years there was a quite an uncertainty about the solar quadrupole moment. No one quite knew how big it was. During the 1960s, uh, Robert Dickey and his student, uh, Mark Goldenberg, tried to measure the quadrupole moment of the sun by a very clever experiment. They took a disk, a circular disk, and mounted on a telescope that was whose size and, and, the, and the focus was arranged so that the disk would really almost perfectly obscure the sun. Um, and then uh, almost like a, a, an eclipse of the sun by the moon. And the idea was to, to try to measure the optical shape of the sun by looking for whether the sun was sort of brighter, whether this little rim of light that, that came through was brighter at the equator than at the poles. Now, this is a very difficult experiment to do for a variety of reasons. They had to worry about atmospheric distortion, which distorts the shape of any object whose light passes through the atmosphere, but they accounted for that. Um, they also did things like they, they spun the disk because the disk itself, the telescope, uh, might be uh, might have some distortion. So they did all the tricks you needed to, to do to try to take care of that. And they indeed discovered that the rim, oh, and they also worried about a, a fact that, that, that people pointed out, that the brightness of the sun at the equator might be more than at the pole, not because the sun is flattened compared to this disk, but because the sun is actually hotter at the equator than at the pole. So that would make the, the equator more bright, even if the rim was perfectly annular 
it would still be bright, more brighter at the equator because the sun could be brighter at the equator. We know there are more sunspots along the equator, there are more faculty along the equator of the sun, so the solar equator is quite different from its poles intrinsically, and so you're worried about that. So they did tricks like changing the diameter of the disk so that if, the, uh, if it was just a temperature effect, the variation between pole and equator would be different than if it were an actual physical oblateness. Right? If, if the temperature, if it weren't temperature, then as you shrunk the disk, you would still get exactly the same brightness because you're seeing a, a more of the sun, but the temperature is the same, but you still see this fatter part at the equator reflecting a shape. They argued, of course, also that the shape of the surface of the sun, as seen optically, corresponded with the shape of the, corresponded with the quadrifold moment. Now that's an assumption. You're assuming that the equipotential of gravity corresponds to an equipotential, the actual surface of the sun. For perfect fluid, that's true, but you have to worry about whether the sun is all that perfect. There are lots of dynamical motions. 1964, they reported that the quadrifold moment of the sun was about uh, three times uh, 10 to the minus five, about 150 times larger than the number I've quoted there. So if you increase this by a factor of, say, 100, this effect would be three arc seconds per century and not 0.3. Well, that would have caused huge trouble for general relativity because it had agreed with the 43 arc seconds that were measured, but if three arc seconds comes from the quadrupole moment, then you would have to explain something like 39 arc seconds, not 39 or 40, not the 43, because three of them come from this, if their measurement of the quadrupole moment is correct. But of course, at the same time, Dickey was promoting a scalar tensor theory of gravity that he developed with his student Carl Brands, that for a reasonable choice of the brand sticky coupling constant actually predicted 39 arc seconds per century for British, a little less than GR, so 39 plus 3 would agree with the observed amount. So from Dickey's point of view, this all came together to support the brand sticky theory and not general relativity. And this controversy lasted for about 15 years. It's very difficult to measure, uh, to really measure uh, the quadrupole moment by these optical needs. Other people tried it, Henry Hill and others got varying results. Over time, people be, be, really, the observations sort of went against such a very, very large quadrupole moment. But eventually the solution came. The measurement of the quadrupole moment came from a completely different direction. And that was the field of helioseismology. People discovered that the sun is actually oscillating in a series of normal modes. Uh, and then you could do this by just measuring the Doppler shift of spectral lines at the surface of the sun, and people found those, those spectral lines just oscillated in time in a whole array of uh, frequencies, normal mode frequencies. And furthermore, that those frequencies were split because the sun is rotating. It's almost like the Zeeman splitting of uh, atomic lines in a magnetic field. So a fundamental mode would actually be split into various m values. And by looking at studying those normal modes, building models of the sun to predict all that array of normal mode oscillations, they could determine the rotation rate of the sun, not just at the surface, which we know we can observe how fast the sun rotates at the surface, but also deep into the interior. Okay, a big question is, is the sun rotating in the interior faster than at the surface? Is it differentially rotating? If it's just rotating uniformly like a solid body, you would expect a quadrupole moment of about 10 to the minus 7, just from conventional centrifugal flattening. If you put in that rotation rate, the radius of the sun, that's what you get. For Dickey to get something 100 times larger, he had to postulate an extremely rapidly rotating core that would be flattened much more and would then give us such a large quadrupole moment. Dickey also argued that this rapidly rotating core would explain some discrepancies in measurements of the abundances of elements that would by a nuclear synthesis in the center of the sun, with lots of arguments. But Pulio seismology shot that all down. Because each normal mode depended on the distribution of angular velocity of the sun deep into the interior, by studying all these normal modes and looking at the solar models that agreed with all this oscillation data, they basically showed that the interior of the sun is not rotating extremely rapidly, maybe at most 10 times faster than the surface, but a relatively uniformly rotating model is the best model. And from those models, they could then uh, determine the 
quadrupole moment of 2.2 times 7 minus 7. So that gives a small effect. Leaves uh, grand CP theory uh, with a small value of the Putney constant, not viable anymore. You have to pick a large value. So general relativity was very, you know, worked fine for the quadrupole moment, for the uh, Mercury's periodic. And in fact, with modern data on Mercury's orbit, uh, this quadrupole moment can also be estimated just by its effect on the Mercury's orbit, and the numbers agree now with the helial seismology value. So this uh, effect of a quadrupole moment is a very important one for uh, Mercury. But it also has other uh, interesting applications. So for example, with, if we look at the mode, the node, the advance of the node, so if you have an orbit that's inclined relative to the equatorial plane of the Earth, that node will, will rotate, so the plane of that orbit will rotate around due to the quadrupole moment. If you put in the numbers uh, for a, uh, a satellite at a semi-major axis A, R is, in, is the radius of the Earth, uh, I is the inclination angle relative to the equator of the Earth, you get a rather hefty amount, 3,600 degrees per year for the advance of the node. So for example, there's a, 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 two satellites orbiting the Earth called Lagios that are used to measure the effect of frame dragging, the relativistic dragging of inertial frames of the Earth that will also cause the orbital plane of the satellite to precess a little bit. Well, at the, the altitude of these Lagios satellites, uh, 1.93 solar radii, the inclination of about 100 degrees, uh, the effect is enormous, 120 degrees per year. The effect of the frame dragging due to general relativity is about 30 some odd arc seconds per year. It's a very tiny effect. So to measure the GR effect, you have to know this effect is extremely accurate. So you can subtract it off, take care of it, and then look for the very tiny bit on top of it. For this mission, for this series of experiments to measure frame dragging, they made good use of the grace data that I talked about earlier that has measured all these multiple moments at extremely high precision, so that it's to track off all the multiple moment effects, J2, J4, 6, all, all around them, take care of all that, and then we're able to measure the frame dragging effect of GR uh, to about 10% uh, precision, and they hope ultimately to get, uh, say, to 5 and maybe even 1%. Another important application of this dragging, of this um, advance of the line of nodes of a satellite, is that you can select an inclination and a semi-major axis of your orbit so that the rate of pre pre uh, the rate of advance of the line of nodes is 360 degrees per year. Okay, just pick I properly and A properly. So that means that you would have an orbit that will precess around this of the orbital plane of the Earth, that will precess around the Earth once per year. So that orbit will always keep its face pointed toward the sun, right? because the sun goes around the Earth once per year. So this is how you establish sun-synchronous orbits around the Earth. If you want an orbit so that it always looks toward the sun and never gets blocked by the Earth, or maybe always looks away from the sun and never uh, has the sun encounter it, then you put it into a sun-synchronous orbit using uh, 1.5 solar radii of the Earth as the radius and a 66 degree inclination. So that's an orbit that will always have its face either pointed away from the sun or toward the sun, depending on what experiment you want to do. So here's just a practical, you know, satellite type application of this basic perturbation effect. Here, of course, you're putting the quadrupole moment of the Earth, not the, of the sun, but you can work all those numbers out. Okay? So any questions about this sort of final application? Okay, very good. So this is our final discussion, bit of discussion of Newtonian theory. We can all relax and head on toward general relativity. And so what I want to do in the, this lecture and the next is to introduce general relativity, a lightning introduction to the theory. You've probably seen some of this from earlier lecturers. But then really focus on uh, formulating general relativity in this manner that will lead us to post-Newtonian theory and post minkowski theory. Okay, so general relativity. So in some sense we return to where we started this, this series of lectures, the weak equivalence principle, which is really a 
foundation for Einstein's theory. Test bodies fall with the same acceleration, the weak equivalence principle, and we've talked about the various experiments that show that they're very high precision, that seems to be true. But there's more to this so-called Einstein equivalence principle that you need to really use as a foundation for general relativity and theories like it. The second piece of this Einstein principle is that if you put yourself in a local freely falling frame, so that's a frame that falls with the same acceleration as any other body, so you're in a freely falling frame, and you do various physics experiments in that frame, the, uh, whatever, the results of any such experiment should be independent of the velocity of the frame relative to any other bodies in the universe. So this is a statement of Lorentz invariance, or really local Lorentz invariance. This is not global. We're not saying the universe is governed by the global uh, Lorentz invariance, but within a local freely falling frame, so that you can ignore inhomogeneities in the gravitational field outside that. Uh, you're in free fall, so that free moving bodies are just floating next to you. The results, uh, physics, non-gravitational physics, the ENM, the standard model of particle physics, whatever, will be independent of the velocity of the frame. That's a local Lorentz invariance. And the third piece is that in the same, under the same conditions in a local freely falling frame, do various non-gravitational experiments, the results will be independent of the location of the frame. You'll get the same result if you want to measure the fine structure constant with some electrical experiment. If you're sitting in free fall near the Earth, in free fall near the Sun, in empty space, orbiting just outside the event horizon of a black hole, fine structure constant will be the same wherever you are. It will not depend on your location. If you believe, and there are many experiments that actually test each of these aspects, very, some of these extraordinarily precise experiments of verified local Lorentz invariance to very high precision, and many other experiments also show, notably the gravitational redshift measurement and measurements of various possible variations of constants, like the fine structure constant, show that this is also true to high precision. So this is then the basis for the idea, you can you could make a very strong argument, that if this is all true, then the correct theory of gravity must be a metric theory of gravity. A metric theory of gravity is one in which <clears throat> in uh, a local freely fall falling frame, there's a metric tensor, it's just the Minkowski metric, that as we know, governs special relativity. So in, so in, in this freely falling frame, the there's a, there's a metric of space-time, but in that frame, the metric locally takes the form of the Minkowski metric. And uh, so all of non-gravitational physics is governed that way in a local frame. But if you do that, then there's a way to ask yourself, well, then how do we look at uh, the laws of physics if we're not in a freely falling frame? Uh, then the simple rules from differential geometry tell you to take A to be new, the Minkowski metric, in, say, Maxwell's equations, and just replace it with a, a, a space-time metric that now could be very in space and time, g mu nu. Wherever you see partial derivatives in your laws of physics, replace a partial derivative with a covariant derivative, comma goes to semicolon rule. And sort of the bottom line of this idea is that the effects of gravity are really nothing but geometry. Everything, all the behavior of normal matter, non-gravitational physics, is governed by a symmetric metric tensor, and everything you know about gravity comes from that, and that tensor governs the, the shape of space-time, the, the, how clocks tick, how rods behave, and so uh, it, so the, the simplest statement of a theory like general relativity is that gravity is synonymous with geometry. Okay, I'm not going to go through some, some of the arguments. You can't say a mathematical theorem that you could prove rigorously. It's just a, a very strong argument that if all this is true, then, then you uh, pretty much have to have a metric theory of gravity. Okay. General relativity is a metric theory of gravity, but it's not the only one. There are many, many right, alternative theories. The brand sticky theory, for example, as I just mentioned, there's now, has always been and continues to be, uh, an industry of inventing alternative theories of gravity for various reasons. Some simply because in the early days, especially, people just didn't like general relativity. They thought it was too complicated. 
So they invented their own theories of gravity, most of which are even more complicated than general relativity. Um, in recent days, of course, the industry has gotten ramped up considerably because of things like the problem of dark matter, the acceleration of the universe, the apparent incompatibility of general relativity with quantum mechanics, difficulty finding a quantum theory of gravity. So lots of alternative theories of gravity are being invented as we speak to try to handle some or all of these various mysteries that seem to present themselves to us. But on, essentially, all of those theories are metric theories of gravity. They start with this. What they change is how matter generates the metric. But once you have the metric, matter responds to that metric according to these rules. Now, I'm not going to talk about alternative theories of gravity at all in these lectures, but we'll just focus on general relativity for simplicity. But I just wanted to say that uh, this idea of gravity being geometry is something that's common to essentially all the alternative theories that you might hear about or see. Massive gravity, einstein dilaton gauss bonnet theory, Churton-Simon theory, blah, 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 blah. Uh, they start with this. OK, any questions about this principle? Yeah. Um, does that imply something the other way around? Like, if we were to measure um, that one of those things are wrong, would we still be Well, there are two possibilities. One, it could be it's possible that this is just an approximate statement. And so at some level, it might be not quite so accurate, but for many applications, you can still make this assumption. In fact, the low energy limit of many models of superstring theory actually violate this principle because they have couplings like dilaton fields that, that actually couple the matter in a way that violate things like the weak equivalence principle, but at a very low level. And in fact, the level could be negligible if this dilaton acquires a big enough mass, so it's so short range you never measure it, or blah, blah. there are lots of ways to, to get around it. Um, but so in that sense, it's really just a problem. So there's this claim superstring theory you know, predicts general relativity. Well, it really doesn't. It predicts a general relativity with a scalar field that can mess things up, but at a very, very low level. So you know, for all practical purposes, you could treat that as a, as a metric theory, but you should keep in the back of your mind. There might be a, an example or an experiment that might show a difference one day. OK, any other comments? OK, I want to talk now just focus on special relativity to keep things simple. And uh, I want to use kind of the aphorism that John Wheeler always uh, talked about. Uh, it's discussed in Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, and, and he emphasized it, that, that in general relativity, you can think of gravity as kind of two pieces. First, curved space-time tells matter how to move, and then matter tells space-time how to curve. So here, the uh, this is really a simple example of the Einstein equivalence principle. Uh, how does matter move in a gravitational field? Well, in special relativity, you know there's an action for a particle moving in special relativity. So you just integrate the uh, proper time between two events. Uh, you multiply it by mc squared if you want to have units of an action. And then that, uh, you vary that thing, you can get the motion of a particle in a freely falling frame in special relativity. And of course, a particle just moves on a straight line because this just involves the Minkowski metric. But our Einstein equivalence principle tells us if we want to introduce gravity, we simply replace A with G. So now we get the action looks like this. It's just G alpha beta with the four velocity, four velocity, and a factor out of a factor dt, just so we can think in terms of a, the normal Lagrangian that you're used to from mechanics. So the idea is, uh, in, with gravity, the action of a freely falling particle is given by this thing. And the idea is you extremize the action. You consider a particle moving from one event in space time to another, from one to two. And you consider all possible paths in space time joining one to two. So you vary this action, considering all possible paths, and ask which path extremizes the action. In this case, it's the path path that maximizes the proper time between the two. <clears throat> when you do that, and just use standard uh, 
you know, variational principle on this thing, you end up getting derivatives of g alpha beta, you end up with the so-called geodesic equation. It's simply the euler lagrange equations for this action given by this. So the acceleration of, the, of this the world line, this is a four dimension, Greek indices run over four dimensions, these are four velocities, and you have these Christoffel symbols that are involved partial derivatives of the metric. So there's the formula for the Christoffel symbol, symmetric on alpha beta. Um, and that, that just comes, it's just the Euler Lagrange equations for this Lagrangian that gives you the motion of a freely moving particle. If you want, you could add to this an action for electromagnetic fields electrodynamics, action for the standard model of particle physics, you can put in all of non-gravitational physics you want, and just as long as you remember to put in g mu nu where necessary, you will get the right equations of motion by varying that action. But now in curve space-time, there are two different kinds of derivatives. Here I talked about the partial derivatives, just the standard derivative with respect to one coordinate, holding all the others fixed. But there's also another kind of uh, derivative, a so-called covariant derivative. And then you have to define if you want to say, what is the derivative of a four vector in space-time? So how does this vector change in space-time? Well now, you, uh, unlike the case of uh, sort of flat space-time or Cartesian space or even special relativity, there are really two pieces to this grade, this derivative. One, the derivative of each component of the vector, just a partial derivative of each component uses a function of space-time, but then there's a derivative of the basis vectors. These may not anymore be just fixed in space and time. They could vary as you go around, so you have to worry about the variation of the basis vectors themselves. And it turns out, since the, in curved space-time, these vectors are defined to be, uh, their inner product is just the space-time metric, just as in special relativity, the inner product between basis vectors is either minus one, 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 one. For the Minkowski metric, this is the full metric, and you can show that these derivatives of the basis vectors simply produce the same Christoffel symbols that I showed there. So the derivative of a vector can really be written as a covariant derivative of the components times uh, a basis vector, where the covariant derivative is now a sum of the partial derivative and a, and a construction that includes the Christoffel symbols. Okay, so in general relativity, you have to worry about this new kind of uh, derivative, the covariant derivative. You can also show, for example, that this preferred path that you get by uh, maximizing the proper time between two events is, and this equation, this geodesic equation, actually has the property that the uh, four velocity that the covariant derivative of the four velocity, which is the space-time tangent vector to this path, that covariant derivative along that path vanishes. Okay? A geodesic essentially parallel transports its own tangent vector. So it, this vector does not change in this covariant sense along itself. You can actually think of that as an example of that on the Earth. You know that the geodesics on the surface of the Earth are the great circles say the equator, lines of longitude, or other curves, but it's a great circle. So, but what is a great circle? Suppose you're on the equator, you're walking along this equator, and you, you have a direction, and you do not veer, veer to the right or to the left. You keep, keep on your same direction. You're parallel transporting your own basis vector, your, your, your own velocity vector. Your velocity vector is this way, and as you move, you keep going in the direction of that velocity vector, neither right or left. Of course, you're going around the Earth because the Earth is a curved surface, but that doesn't matter. You're still keeping as straight as you possibly can. However, if you're at 88 degrees latitude north and you want to walk along that latitude, you are now turning to the left or right because the North Pole is right there. You're, you can sense that you're turning, so you're not on a geodesic anymore. You're not parallel transporting your bed, your velocity right here because you keep moving up. Whereas on a great circle, you are always following your own velocity vector, parallel transporting as you walk along. Even though, you, as you know, you're going around the Earth, you're not on a uh, Cartesian plane. So that's kind of an intuitive way of thinking about this idea of uh, the special nature of a geodesic. 
It's the straightest path, in quotes, in a curved uh, space-time. Okay, any comments, questions? As I say, this is a lightning introduction to general relativity. It's not meant to replace any textbook discussion. Just as in Newtonian theory, we want to go beyond just point masses or point particles or test bodies. We want to worry about uh, fluids. So we want to replace the standard, all everything, we, the lore we developed for Newtonian theory with a more relativistic lore. And in this case, it turns out that you can describe fluids by a secondary tensor, energy momentum tensor or stress energy tensor that is constructed from four velocity of the little fluid element that we find. Uh, it's small compared to the uh, greater system or inhomogeneities in the external world, but large enough that you could coarse grain it, contains enough atoms that you can uh, coarse grain and, and describe it as a fluid, as a continuous system, characterized by a rest mass energy density. So just add up the rest masses of all the atoms in this fluid element, divide by the volume, and you get the rest mass density. An energy density, so this thing could have thermal energy, magnetic energy, whatever. And pressure. Pressure is defined in exactly the same way. Take a surface of the fluid element, measure the force per unit area on that surface. This is all done locally in a local freely falling frame. But with all these ingredients and the floor velocity of this fluid, this fluid's moving, so you calculate its floor velocity in space time, you construct this tensor. So it's this combination, product of four velocities, and then a term, an additional term that involves the pressure and the method. It's also useful to define a mass, a rest mass current vector. So it's the rest mass density rho times the four velocity that defines a current vector. And you can go through various arguments to show that these things satisfy two fundamental conservation laws. The covariant derivative of the stress energy tensor vanishes. So this is basically an equation of motion that tells you how the, this fluid behaves as it moves through curved space time. And this is true no matter what theory of gravity you're talking about. This is simply true because of the fact that uh, local physics in a local freely falling frame obeys this rule. This comes from a special relativity. You can also show that it comes from the action for any local gravitational field theory. Uh, this just comes from the fact that the action is uh, covariant. You get this. So this is a fundamental rule that's true in any theory of gravity, no matter what you do. And this rule is simply is a, is a reflection of the conservation of baryon number. We added up the total rest mass of atoms. The atoms have some total baryon number because they're and baryon number is conserved at least to some very, very high accuracy, right? There's been no evidence of proton decay uh, within some period, I think it's up to about 10 to the 33 years is the lifetime of the proton. So we know that baryons are conserved to very high accuracy. This is just a reflection of that number, of that fact that the total rest mass density is really a conserved current. Baryons are, don't just disappear suddenly. Now it turns out that this uh, fundamental equation of motion can be split up into two pieces. You can take this thing, there's a free index alpha, and so you can contract that on the four velocity of the fluid element. So you have this equation, which is zero, and take the component of uh, the four velocity and contract on all four indices. That vanishes. But then when you work that out using that formula, you find this is the result. At the rate of change, along the fluid element with respect to the proper time of the energy density, plus e plus p times the divergence of the four velocity vanishes. And this is just a, the first law of thermodynamics that we talked about before, but in a relativistic language. You combine these pieces appropriately, you can see this just the rate of change of total energy in our fluid element is equal to the work done, the PDV work done by the external world. But this is you know, generally covariant. It's, a, it's not dependent on any coordinates. It's a covariant expression for that first law of thermodynamics, which we know has to be satisfied in our local freely falling frame. Nothing but local physics. Then 
take the component of this uh, fundamental equation motion orthogonal to forward velocity, so it's in the space-time direction that, that is orthogonal to that, and you get the relativistic Euler equation, which says that the acceleration, the rate, the covariant derivative with respect to proper time of the forward velocity, so that's just the forward acceleration, times a, a, an inertial mass density is equal to the gradient of the pressure. Okay. Now you might think there's some, some several, a number of things are strange about this equation. If we compare it to oh, that was the, that was again was the, this is the relative version of our second law of thermodynamics uh, that we saw before. This is in, in relativistic language. If we compare this with Newtonian, Newtonian, you see some sort of striking differences. Here's dv dt. Well, that's obviously the analog of this four acceleration. But here we have rho. Here we have mu plus p. Mu is just uh, rho plus the energy density. Um, but there's p. The pressure also contributes to the inertial mass density in, in relativistic physics. Non-relativistically, it's just the, the, the mass density. But here it's the mass energy density. Now you have to include energy because it's relativity. Rho plus epsilon is mu. But Pressure also contributes. And this comes from this equation, but you can make various hand-waving arguments to understand why that actually makes sense when you are in a relativistic world. Here is the gradient of the pressure. Okay, that's what we got in Newtonian theory. It's a the gradient uh, orthogonal to the forward velocity. This just projects this gradient in a direction that's orthogonal to you. So that's fine, but what happened? Where did the gravitational potential go? In Newtonian theory, we had grad u, it seems to have disappeared. Where did it go? It's in the covariant derivative. I'm sorry? It's in the covariant derivative on u. Yeah, this covariant derivative is going to contain Christoffel symbols, and those things will have derivatives of the metric, and the metric is like gravity, so this covariant derivative is going to have grad u plus a whole lot of other stuff in it. So, in fact, you can just show it. You take the Newtonian limit, very weak gravitational fields, and this will simply reduce to that uh, in that Newtonian limit. Okay, so this, this, these are the kinds of equations, for example, you might use if you wanted to build neutron star models. You have to include general relativity now. You can't just do Newtonian theory. So this would be the basis for relativistic stellar structure calculations. Okay, so this is curved space-time telling matter how to move. If you have a metric, that gives you covariant derivatives. Derivatives of the metric, that will tell you how matter behaves. But now we have the second uh, side of Wheeler's uh, law, rule. Matter tells space-time how to curve. And this is here is where we assume general relativity. Everything I said in the last three or four slides was, was True for any theory of gravity, any metric theory of gravity. But now we focus on general relativity itself. So from those Christoffel symbols, you can construct a number of objects that characterize space-time. The Reed Riemann tensor, made up of derivatives and products of the Christoffel symbols. It's a four-index uh, tensor. It's anti-symmetric on the first pair, first pair of indices when you and anti-symmetric on the second pair. You can use the metric, you can contract on alpha and gamma, so sum over all four values of, of these indices. And you get an object called the Ricci tensor. You can contract again uh, with the metric and get the Ricci scalar. So these are fundamental tensors that characterize space time. Einstein's theory takes these uh, tensors, the Ricci tensor, and the Ricci scalar, it constructs the Einstein tensor, which has a very unique property that if its covariant divergence, the divergence of this, is also vanishes, which are called the Bianchi identities. It's just a property of these tensors that have been defined. It's automatically true. To get an actual theory of gravity, uh, one way is to, is to write down an action for the theory. 
action principle is the way these days one constructs all theories of physics. And in this case, for general relativity, the action is given by the Ricci scalar, uh, root minus square root of the determinant of the metric, integrated over all space time. And then you add to that the action for matter, electrodynamics, the standard model of physics, and that gives the action for the theory. When you vary this action using, again, the uh, euler lagrange principle, uh, involves varying root minus g times r, you end up with just d minus sine tensor g alpha beta, and from varying the action of matter, you get the stress energy tensor of mass, and, and result is time sense equations. Okay, so there's Einstein's theory in one, in one slide. But I'm assuming that you've had at least some background uh, courses in general relativity, so you've seen this uh, spelled out in, in more detail and gone through the process to get to this final state. But I now want to immediately turn to discussing Einstein's equations in a quite different manner than this. Okay, this these Einstein's equations, of course, are very simple, very elegant. We all know they're absolutely horrendous. They're second order partial differential equations, nonlinear couple. It's, it's terrible. Um, you've heard Harold talk about numerical relativity, formulating Einstein's equations to put on a computer. It's a, it's a major challenge. So, this deceptive simplicity hides a lot of uh, ugliness. But I want to formulate these equations in a rather different way that allows us to really talk uh, about. Approximations to solutions, not numerical solutions, not exact solutions that many people look for, but ways to systematically get approximate solutions to these equations uh, that will help us in many uh, practical uh, applications, both in testing GR and in astrophysics. And that's a formulation called the Landau Lifshitz formulation of general relativity. It was put together by Landau and Lushitz, I think, for the first time in their famous textbook of the late 40s. It's gone through many editions. Um, and it's a quite remarkable way of rewriting uh, Einstein's equations. The first thing you do is to define a new kind of a metric. We call it the Gothic metric density, just because all these are Gothic Gs are distinguished from the normal G. It's not even a tensor anymore, it's a tensor density, because we have multiplied by the square root of the determinant of the metric. So it's minus root minus g times g alpha beta. And here we will use the upstairs indices uh, for this basic definition. So we just define this object. You then define another object called h, alpha mu beta nu. The same is it's just a product of two of these Gothic metrics with the indices placed in a clever way, but it's anti-symmetric on the first two indices, anti-symmetric on the second two indices, and symmetric when you interchange the pairs. Actually, it's exactly the same symmetries as the, uh, as the Riemann tensor. Now, when you take this object and Take two partial derivatives of it that are contracted on alpha and on mu and nu. You get Einstein's, the Einstein tensor, plus some additional terms. If we impose Einstein's equations, the Einstein tensor can simply be replaced by the stress energy tensor of matter, and then you have the additional terms that come from that instruction. Okay, so this two derivatives of this object then contain the energy momentum tensor matter and an object called the Landau Lifshitz pseudo tensor. Now right away you say, well, gee, this isn't this isn't too, too good. I've got partial derivatives here. We're no longer working in kind of a generally covariant language, right? Because partial derivatives are not generally covariant. And that's absolutely true. And in fact, that's the way it should be, because we want to do practical applications. We want to do practical uh, calculations. And when you want to do any practical calculation, you have to choose a coordinate system to do your calculation. Okay. General relativity is beautifully covariant, independent of coordinates, and blah, blah, blah. All that formality is great. 
But if you really want to find the orbit of a planet in the solar system, or the orbit of two black holes around each other, you've got to pick a coordinate system to do your calculations. You simply can't do that in a coordinate-free manner. So if one day you're going to have to pick coordinates and, and, and give up general covariance, why not do it right from the start? So already we're looking at equations that where we pick some kind of a coordinate system, and we're going to specialize that coordinate system in a moment, right from the get-go, formulate the equations in a non-covariant way, and then we'll use them to push forward. OK, so that's one remark. The second remark is this landau lifshitz pseudotensor is a remarkable beast also, because it is quadratic in the first derivatives of, the, of this Gothic metric. So it, it, it's a string of terms. I won't show it. You can look it up in various books, Foss on the Wheel, Mr. Thorne Wheeler, or landau Lishitz's own book. It's a, it takes about four lines to express it. It kind of looks messy, but if you're in this game long enough, you get kind of used to it. Uh, you, you grow to even love it. And I can tell you that uh, she loves this object. But first of all, there are no second derivatives. We know Einstein's equations are, are second partial derivatives. It's a uh, you know, secondary system of equations. But this object contains only first derivatives. And it's quadratic in G. There's nothing linear. Quadratic in height, but there's nothing linear. Okay. So that will prove to be very important later on. Second thing, remark I want to make, is that if I take this object and put another grid, say, partial with respect to beta and sum over all beta, what do I get? Well, I have to get zero. Why? Why do I get zero? But you partially respect the data here. It's what? It's anti, it's anti symmetric. Beta and nu, the partials are symmetric when they're interchange, but this is anti symmetric when they're interchange. So it has to match. So that means that the partial derivative of that side must vanish. So that says you have a kind of conservation law. Remember, our old conservation law was the covariant derivative. T vanishes, that's the fundamental equation of motion that's true in any always. But we get a slightly different looking equation that says the partial derivative of this object that contains T, also contains the determinant of the metric, but also in addition has the landau lishitz bit, that piece obeys the partial derivative of vanishing. But that will be extremely important because if you have a law like this where you have a partial derivative, you can convert this into, you can integrate this thing and convert it into surface integrals, just the way you do in electrodynamics and other fields. We cannot do it here, try to find some conserved quantity here because of the Christoffel symbols that are in, in here that mess everything up. This thing has no Christoffel symbols. It's just a pure partial derivative. We'll see this in a moment, how, how we can do it. Conservation laws, global conservation laws, by exploiting this object, this partial derivative. Okay. It finally turns out that these two equations are equivalent to each other, in fact, in the following sense. This is always true, no matter, even if the field equations of your theory aren't satisfied, this is true. This is a fundamental, this is local physics. The laws of local physics just expressed in the very but if you take this and assume that you've solved this equation, the field equations, combine them together, then it turns out this gives equations of motion for your matter that are completely equivalent to the equations of motion shown there. So if, for example, you are you working on solutions of these equations that you want to solve, now use the metric you've derived to find the equations of motion of your two black holes, then you can use either this version or that version. Either one will work. So it's just, that's just a remark. Okay. Yeah. You're doing an integral of the regular covariant stress energy conservation. You can still move the covariant derivative and generate surface terms using the covariant version of the Stokes integration. So what's the problem here? So I don't know what you mean by it. I mean, you can still move covariant derivatives, right, when you're integrating. In big surface terms, as usual. 
Sorry, not me. Right. So, I mean, so for example, suppose you wanted to uh, look at convert this into a you can convert it to a space-time surface term, right? You can convert a total derivative inside of a space-time integral into into in surface integrals on the boundaries of the four-dimensional space-time block. Well, but this, but remember, this is not a this is this is a derivative plus two terms involve gamma multiplying t alpha beta. What do you do with those terms if you're integrating? You can't. Those are volume integrals. You can't turn those into a surface integral. But here you can. Well, let's, maybe the next slide will show because I'm going to do exactly uh, what you're what you're proposing. I mean, with this formulation, you can now define globally conserved quantities. Suppose we define something if we want to call it the energy. It kind of makes sense. T zero zero. That's a zero component. It looks like energy. But let's use this full object, including the land on Lipschitz pseudo tensor, the minus g that always is there. Let's look at that. Now, if we ask what is d e d t, right? You take a time derivative of the integral, bring the time derivative inside, so you partial of t with respect to that, but that's equal to minus the coordinate divergence of the thing, and that converts into a surface term, and that's what you get here. We'll assume there's no matter at infinity, your surface is way outside the matter, so all you have is an undulation. So the rate of change of energy is given by whatever this guy is integrated over the surface. You couldn't do that with the covariant version because you have two terms that involve gamma multiplying t that you don't know what to do. You can't convert those into surface terms. They're just volume integrals. So this gives us a very nice way to discuss globally conserved quantities and how they might change. And of course the point is that if this Landau Lifshitz will contain the gravitational waves once we've solved the problem. And this will be the flux of the energy to infinity emitted in gravitational waves. But this, this formulation with uh, purely partial derivatives is what makes this possible. But just remember, we've given up sort of doing things in a, in a generally covariant way. We've chosen some kind of coordinate system and coordinate derivatives to, to play this game. And you can do the same thing for things like uh, momentum. You can define the momentum as the J0 component of that thing uh, that is conserved in the same way apart from a, some surface integral of any flux. You can find an angular momentum quantity. This is the uh, levi civita anti-symmetric symbol. And then you know, this is just x cross p, or x cross v, roughly speaking. So that would be the angular momentum. You can find a center of mass of your system, just the same object weighting the position of each uh, fluid element integrated over all space, and then divide by the mass or energy of the system. So, and these things all have a similar kind of a conservation expression. The P dt, the J dt, the X dt, then will depend on uh, this, what this landau lifshitz pseudo tensor is doing at a surface very far from your system. Okay. And you can show off if the system is stationary, and this thing turns out to vanish, or at least fall off with R so fast as you let R go to infinity, it's faster than the r squared factor here, then the right hand side becomes zero, and these things truly are constants of, of the system. Okay. So we're not done, however, with this land of Lipschitz formulation. We can make it even more useful by specifying our coordinates. By choosing now, making an explicit choice of coordinate system, we didn't make it that explicit earlier on, but now we're going to specify it explicitly. And it's useful to first define a new object, H. Again, it's not a tensor, it's a tensor density, but it's the difference between our Gothic metric and some flat background Minkowski metric. Of course, the reason for doing this is that we imagine uh, uh, making an approximation in terms of weak gravitational fields. Hopefully, we can, uh, don't have to be super weak, but we'll start with a, an approximation where we're imagining solving this thing with, with weak fields so that we can uh, get higher, higher approximations. So that if, in the absence of any uh, matter at all, we would have some flat space-time metric. 
And so we're looking for deviations from this flat space-time metric represented by the Gothic metric. Okay. And so this A really defines those deviations. At lowest order, in some sense, this is eta, so you get zero, but then when we start uh, in introducing actual gravity, this will cause deviations, and so it'll be H that we use to describe our, this is, in fact, we'll call this the gravitational field. And now we are going to impose a condition on H that actually singles out a set, a specific set of coordinates. We'll demand that H have vanishing di divergence. Again, this is an important divergence. So this is a condition on the coordinates. There are four conditions, right? There are four free values of the index alpha. So we're fixing four of our coordinates. It looks similar in some ways to Lorentz gauge of electrodynamics. Remember in the Lorentz gauge, the, the, the divergence of the, of the vector potential four vector vanishes. So we're doing sort of the same thing. We're then making the divergence on one of the indices of this object vanish. So it's kind of a Lorentz gauge. In fact, it's sometimes called Lorentz gauge. And by the way, something I learned from Eric Poisson, this is the analog of the Lorentz gauge. Turns out it's not Lorentz gauge. There were two guys. There's Hendrik Lorentz of Lorentz transformations. And then there was a guy called Lorentz without a T. He's the guy who discussed this gauge in electrodynamics back in the 20s or teens or whatever. So this is Lorentz gauge. But it's also called harmonic gauge. It's also called the Donder gauge. Many different words for this particular choice of gauge. But the reason it's called harmonic gauge is the following. Turns out that if you impose this condition, it's an exercise uh, plus on will that you can work out, then if you imagine each coordinate to be a scalar field, x, y, z, and t, and they tend to you have to be Cartesian-like coordinates. So take those four coordinates and pretend that each is a scalar field on space-time. Then this condition requires that each of these scalar fields T, X, Y, and Z, each of these scalar fields satisfy, uh, this is a down version with respect to the curved space time. So this is the down version of each of the four coordinates must vanish. Mathematicians call any such, such function in, a, in any manifold that satisfies this condition a harmonic function. Hence the name harmonic coordinates. So this what we call a Lorenz gauge or the Donner gauge is also equivalent to stating that the four coordinates regarded as scalar fields are harmonic functions on the space time. So we will also call it harmonic gauge. <clears throat> but if you do that, the, uh, those uh, landau lifshitz equations turn out to simplify even more. You plug in that, in here, the g mu nu is, is uh, uh, eta minus h. Take all the derivatives, but then you use this gauge condition to simplify matters. And it will turn out that the right-hand side simply becomes the flat space-time down version of h. There's the down version. Should be a minus sign here. So it's minus d by t squared plus an ordinary Laplacian. So the down, flat space time down version of h is equal to the right hand side, which consists of minus g times the matter stress energy tensor, the landau lifshitz stress energy tensor, plus a little bit extra that came from the left hand side and will push over to the right hand side called a harmonic stress energy tensor. It's just the little bits that didn't vanish over here. And this particular guy has a form, it's uh, proportional to product of first derivatives of h plus one term that involves two derivatives of h. Okay? This is our land elicit pseudo tensor, which we can rewrite just in terms of h instead of plot of g. Um, but it's a very nice equation because this is a we know how to solve the flat space time wave equation. So it depends on the source, depends on h itself. This is like a gravitational stress energy tensor. Somehow it's gravity generating gravity. It's nonlinear in H. And this little extra piece, and we'll see later that this term actually plays a crucial role later on. 
We also still have the fact that this right hand side has vanishing ordinary divergence. In fact, you can show that if you knew that this divergence of this vanished, you can show that the divergence of that vanishes automatically, so the right hand side still has vanishing divergence. Now, of course, it's nice, it had to be that way because the left hand side has vanishing divergence, right? That's our gauge condition. If I take a uh, partial with respect to beta here, I have to get zero. And so, partially with respect to beta there, it better give zero in it. And it does. Okay. Well, really, what I want to emphasize is I've made no approximations so far. This is just Einstein's equations rewritten in a particular way. I've chosen some coordinates, so we're no longer in a nice covariant language with, with capital with the Einstein tensor and stress energy tensor. So I adopted coordinates, it's very non-covariant, right? I've T, X, Y, Z, but it's still mathematically equivalent to Einstein's equations. I've not approximated anything. And again, this reflects, we can see, you know, you look at these equations again from Wheeler's point of view. Here's the equation that, where matter is telling space time how to curve. So matter here, then from that you get H, which is then you can use to construct the metric G. And here, curved space time is telling matter how to move. And these are the equations of motion that you use to make your bodies move in response to the gravitational field that you've derived. Now how do you actually try, we want to try to solve these equations in some manner. And th the way this is done is often called the relaxed Einstein equations. You know, we, we can, in principle, solve this uh, for H because we sort of we know how to use the solve the, the weight equation in terms of the matter variables. But we don't know what the matter variables are yet. We don't won't know them until we've solved the equations of motion. So how do you actually carry that out? So the idea is to solve for H not as a, as a functional of the matter variables. You need the matter variables kind of implicit. The X's and V's of all your particles and your and your fluid elements, the pressures and densities, you need that kind of implicit, but you write down H as functionals of those variables that you don't haven't quite figured out just yet. And you work that expression out. Then you take that expression and plug it into this, which remember contains H and the matter variables, but this is the equation of motion that tells you how those matter variables vary in space and time. So once you've done that, once you get the variation of the matter variables, you can plug those back into the H that you derive and get H as an explicit function of space and time. So it's kind of a multi-step process uh, where you, you know, solve part of the problem in a relaxed way. You don't, you don't know how the matter variables move, but later you find out how they move by using the fundamental equation of motion. This has to be done in a self-consistent way. Uh, you remember that in Einstein's theory, you get the, the Einstein's equations. Uh, matter tells you know space time how to curve, but space time tells matter how to move. So they have to. It's all they're coupled together. Unlike electromagnetic theory, where you can move your charges any way you wish, and still find the electromagnetic field from those charges, right? because there are fields exterior to electromagnetism that can make your charges move any way you wish. Like I could take a magnet and go like this and get the magnetic field, but that, that magnetic field produced by that magnet does not affect the motion of that magnet. Uh, it's just, it, it really makes, it's one of the things that makes general relativity and theories like it unique, that the motion of the matter is coupled to the field that the matter produces in an intrinsic manner. You can't just move one and freely and uh, just calculate the gravitational field. But as we go along, we'll see how we can do this uh, in, by also uh, using method of approximations. Okay. So. 
So maybe this is, so it's 10.40, right? So why don't we take a break now? It seems like a good time to break, and I will then start to attack how we take this fundamental equation, integrate it, and try to understand what those solutions might look like.